I am extremely flexible. Okay. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. How you doing? It's good to see you. Is it good to be seen? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Even more so good to be seen. Let me give a huge shout out to Pearl. She's just been fabulous, right? Yes. From the time that I met her, and I'm not even sure when I um, got on your bandwagon if we had ever really officially met, when I was like, no, she can use the vault. No, she can use whatever she needs to do what she's doing because the work was just so amazing. And so um, just such an honor to be here and uh, to be back in the Jimmy Carter Center. So I have just a few things to share with you because I don't like when I'm between lunch <laughs> and keeping people from lunch. So that, that is not what I want to do. So I will not belabor. Uh, my name is Sonia Booker, and I am affectionately known as the Wealth Builder. Why the Wealth Builder, and how did I get a name like that? When I first started uh, as an entrepreneur over 20 years ago, I really um, realized that a lot of the things I was doing were kind of uncommon, but how yeah, you do things and you don't really know you're just doing them, right? And so I graduated from college and got my first job, and I thought I was on top of the world, had my 401k, making my money, whatever. And I grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. And the way that my um, grandparents made their money was through doing what was called Petlin in the South. So some of you might not know about Petlin, but Petlin is when you grow your crops. We had our black eyed peas, our okra, our turnip greens, and we would go into the big city and we would sell those on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And so as I would go on these business trips with my grandfather, it became very clear to me that, let me get this right, we left with a truck full of produce and we came back with a different kind of green. And I'm like, huh, I like this. I like this creating money kind of thing here. And so as I got more and more into the operation of it and I would spend my summers, my hands would be purple the whole summer because I found out that city folk were lazy and they didn't want to share their black eyed peas, the purple whole peas for the people who are from the deep south. So I said, well, what if I shell the peas, then I can sell them for hire. Aha, an entrepreneur was born. So my grandfather said, well, yeah, if you shell them, you could get the $2 a bag. You can sell them for $2 a bag, and you can keep the $2. I was like, oh, yeah, my hand's going to be purple, because I was counting my coins at that point. So I realized at a young age that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to be someone who could create my own way. And that's how I defined entrepreneurship. When I was 12 years old, Nobody said I was an entrepreneur. It was not even a word that was being used. And so I just knew I wanted to be a person who could take some green produce and come back with some green money. Like that part. <laughs> That's the part I wanted to do. And so as I would go through high school and go through college, I fell into, you know, the other part of the American dream, which said, you go to college, you get a good job. But lucky for me, I did go to college, I did get um, a graduate, I got an MBA, and my grandfather kept saying to me, why are you still on that job? So I'm like, he just don't understand how the world works now. You know, I have this good job. I have my benefits. You know, Big Daddy, that's what we used to call him before it became a corrupt word, you know. Big Daddy, <laughs> you know, I got this good job. And he said, but you get a job to get experience. Why are you still there? So my grandfather literally ran me off my job that when I graduated, when I, when I, the, the moment I graduated with my grad degree, because my company was paying for it, so I said, well, can I at least finish this free graduate degree? 
So I finished that, and that night I packed up and I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, at that point, from Dallas, Texas. So I had gone from Jackson, Mississippi, to New Orleans, to school in Dillard University, back to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, because Dillard costs too much. <laughs> that ran me back real quick. Back to in-state school. Then my first job was in Pensacola, Florida. Then I got another position in Dallas, Texas, and I was at that point working for J.C. Penney. And so as I went through all this and I realized in my corporate position that I was not living up to that 12-year-old anthem who said, I want to be a person who can create and change the world. I realized through bureaucracy that it was no way I was going to change the world in these confines. Me, ceiling, me seeing a ceiling or feeling a ceiling is like not a good thing. So remember, I'm the kid that's looking over hundreds of acres saying, I want to be a person who creates what I see. And I'm looking up, and as far as I can see, I can see land and I can see sky. So you put me in this box, now I can't, I'm not, that's not who I am. And so as I moved to Atlanta, here I was sitting in Piedmont Park, and I figured, you know, this was going to be a good time for me to discover who I am and to find out what my next move would be. So that's what I did. And then I went into insurance at that point, because why did you go into insurance? Because when my grandfather wasn't peddling, he was collecting burial policies. So I thought, I know about insurance. I can get a license and go into insurance. It seemed, all seemed so simple. So I did that, and then I became the youngest Allstate insurance agent. And then after almost <laughs> going bankrupt, I became the top agent for the state of Georgia for four years. Now, they're talking about jumping off cliffs and all kinds of stuff. Like, <laughs> I jump off a cliff like every morning. Every morning I jump off. Every morning. Because that's how I function and operate, and I really feel that that allows me to be the truest to myself. And so what I do now as an entrepreneur, as a real estate developer, I do whatever I want to do. And if I don't want to do it, I don't do it. And so because I want to live true to myself, which is part of my message to everyone here, is to find that, to find that truest purpose, that truest thing. Because if I could tell you from a biblical standpoint, one of my favorite verses is Deuteronomy 8, 18. And it says, God gives you the ability to create, make, produce wealth. That ability is attached to your talent and your gift. And so when you find that and you operate in that, that's where your wealth is. That's your truest wealth that you will ever pull out. And that's the truest time that you'll never feel like you're working. You'll always feel like you're in alignment and you're enjoying what you're doing because you are operating in your gifts and talents. Yeah, makes sense? So as I started and I went on to become, I sold my agency after five years, and I took the proceeds of that and went into real estate investing full time. And again, everything that I do now, I did when I was 12 years old. I just didn't see it the same way. My grandfather was a builder. We have a third um, generation construction company in Mississippi that still operates. And so when I got my license through people who were, you know, the young girls or people that are eager to get their license, when I got my license, 
it was great for everybody because I got to go to 84 Lumber and pick up all of the supplies. So I didn't learn how to drive a cute little sports car or something. I had to drive a rig. I had to like, not, and not look back. You know how you get in the car, what you looking back there for? Nothing back, you use your mirrors, you know, and that, that's how you moved around. So everybody was glad when I got my license. Oh, she can go do pickup. But on that pickup, I got to learn about lumber and building. And so then when I would come back with supplies, I wanted to work with the, the plaster guys and the sheetrock and the brick masons and all that. I can build a house from start to finish. So I'm the worst on any of my construction sites because I know I could do it myself. And so you can't tell me, like, this is right. Like, this is not right. <laughs> so, so that's the, the ability that I connected. So then as I went on and became a real estate investor, I realized something. People were saying to me, Sonia, how are you doing this? And I'm like, didn't everybody, Big Daddy, tell them to, how to invest in real estate and all that? Because we had rental property. We built houses. Everything we lived on the land, we, we completely lived on the land. We built our houses on the land, we built rental properties on the land, we ate off the land, we had cows, horses we would sell to make money. True, true, off the land. And so if I can impart anything to you from finding your purpose and discovering your gifts and talents, it's gonna be the best thing you ever do is to know the value of land and to know why land is so utterly important to everybody is because it's one of the only resources that God's not making any more of. So the land that we have here is our land. Nobody's going to drop another 10,000 acres out the sky. Here's some more land. I put this other land over here. So it has a finiteness to it. So as you drive around and you've seen yourself, like, wow, five years ago, there was nothing there. It was just land. And so the land is always going to be valuable at some time. So I want you to open your eyes up to land and understand why it's so valuable. And I want you to invest in it. I want you to own a piece of it. I want you to understand that in order for your wealth to grow, you have to have assets. And so two of the favorite things that I love to say is the first one, and I want you to, this to become your guiding principle. You build wealth, $1, one decision at a time. And I have some dollar bills for people too. Oh, well, make it rain in here. Woohoo! Yeah, I'm about to make it rain in here. You get a dollar, you get a dollar, you get a dollar. Why is that important? Why is this little dollar important? So when I say, how do you slay? I want you to say, one dollar, one decision at a time. How do you slay? One, one decision at a time. Okay, good. So this little dollar really doesn't mean much. It, it really actually doesn't have much value. It's really funny how this works, just an exchange. And it has our lovely president, George Washington. Who knows the um, number president of Jimmy Carter was? Who knows what president, this is the first president, who knows what president number Jimmy Carter was? Who knows what year? 39. <laughs> okay, I don't know if you Googled that, but I'm gonna give you a copy of the book. So whoever said 39, 39 is correct. I'm gonna give you a copy of my book, Self Wealth for Women, okay. So, 39th president, okay. So. George Washington, first president. Okay, why is this dollar important? And why do you build wealth one dollar, one decision at a time? 
what makes this so valuable, it's, it impacts your mindset. Do you know that we spend more money when we use digital currency, when we're cash shopping, using credit cards, any form of digital, we spend more, we spend 28% more, as a matter of fact, because it's not tangible, it feels intangible to us. So as we're like swiping cards and stuff, do you know how long I would hold on to money? And don't let me have a $100 bill in my purse. I don't want to break it. Because when I break it, it's gone. So when I break it, I, gotta, I don't know exactly what caused me to break it. So the tangibility of money, but nobody wants this dirty money that's passed around and you know, the world is doing us a, a favor going digital, digital currency, making it more convenient for y'all to spend more money, right? Yuck, I don't want a dollar bill. Yeah, it got to the point through the pandemic where we don't accept, we're not gonna put gloves on, we're cashless. It's a mindset. It trains our mindset. This tangibility helps us in our spending. And so because the world has progressed us into this society, of this cashless society and all that, the way that we have to train our mindset now is we have to do it ourselves because we don't have this to trade. And the only way you do that in your finances, how do you slay in your finances? Okay, that's how you do that without having the tangibleness of it. You're always having to be aware of the decisions you're making about every dollar you're spending. Because it seems like it's no big deal. So it's like, okay, a dollar a day, $365, eh, maybe not a big deal. But $5 a day that we could go and spend on a bottle of water, latte, whatever, $5 a day is over $1,800. $1,800, a day. That becomes a big deal. Now that becomes two grand. So when we say we don't have money for a down payment or we can't pay off a credit card, or we can't do whatever, it comes back to what that decision was you've been making with that money. So you have to train your mind that way. And then the other thing that I like to tell people is that wealth is defined by assets, not things. Show me your shoe collection and I'll show you my real estate collection. Which one do you want? <laughs> okay? So we did a whole campaign by real estate, not red bottoms with my women's group. Because at the end of the day, hopefully your daughter, or you like your, your goddaughter or daughter-in-law enough, and they wear your shoe size that they can inherit your shoe collection. Otherwise, it has no value to anybody. So, you build wealth one dollar, one decision at a time. You build wealth with assets, not things. Things have no value. Things disappear, things go away, things, you've bought things that you don't even remember buying. And because I'm here with a mixed group, I want to share my debt story because either I can help keep you from getting in debt or I can help get you out of debt. Either way, because you can't build wealth in debt. Third principle, okay? You cannot build wealth in debt. So, when I was in college having my little life experiences and going to school in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, 
gassing up and driving in for Freaknik. Anybody know about Freaknik? <laughs> freak. Nobody, y'all don't know about it. <laughs> y'all do not know about it. Freaknik. So here I am, got my little Honda Civic, and we driving to Atlanta for Freaknik. And I go in with my credit card, and I'm just swiping. Get some gas, get some coke, get me, you know, my chips, my potato chips, and we ready to roll. Now, nobody told me that debt was a bad thing. I mean, they sent me this credit card, and obviously, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it. So it seemed all so simple. Me using my credit card that I got just because I was enrolled in college. Wow. How awesome is that? This is so cool to be in college and get free stuff in your P.O. box. Already tracking me. I'm already in somebody's debt system. I already have a number on my head. By the time I graduated, I had a $300 original credit limit that was a thousand dollar credit limit and I had no job. I was like, what? Paying twenty dollars minimum payment for years. It's the best thing ever. Until I'm in my twenties somewhere with a real job paying credit card debt from stuff that I don't even remember no more. That wasn't even that fun at this point. Like, when did I go to Atlanta? I don't even know. What is this? What am I still paying for? So they're just sending me the credit card bill every month. And by that time, when you're so far in debt, they don't even send you, uh, you don't even get any detail. You just get the amount, minimum payment, and the interest. <laughs> and the due date. And if you don't pay everybody in, it's gonna go, you'll get a late fee. So all I'm trying to focus on is, I don't want the $20 late fee. So one day I'm sitting there and I'm like, somebody's like, you wanna go to Bahamas? We gonna take a trip, we go. I can't go nowhere, I'm in debt, I am in debt. I am in a real live life situation, working every day, paying for stuff that I don't even remember. It keeps you living in the past. That's what that, I have financed my past. I'm just living there. I can't do anything. I can't even think about the future. The future, what? So I call the credit card company and I say, can you send me my statements? I just, just send me the copies. Like, what am I even paying for? I don't, I really don't know. Remember opening that envelope and sitting down I know this is bad, okay. How many people read in the bathroom? Nobody gonna claim it, nobody gonna claim it, nobody gonna claim it. Okay, thank you, thank you sis, thank you. Read in the bathroom. So, I mean, even the bathtub, okay, not just, you know, yeah, in the bathtub, right. So I remember reading this statement, going through it, and at some point I remember sitting on the bathroom floor with a calculator going, this 50 cent bag of potato chips has cost me $1,000, $1,000 in interest. 10 years later, paying for that bag of potato chips. You snap out of stuff real quick, like, I have got to pay this off. This is crazy. So for my young folk, because nobody told me, now remember, I'm on a farm in Mississippi. My family didn't have any debt. My big daddy wasn't in nobody debt. He didn't know that people were gonna send me credit cards. He didn't even know to tell me to be on the lookout. My mom, nobody knew, because that wasn't a thing for them. So here I done got caught up in the debt and the debt trap, thinking I'm doing something flossing it out. And so that is something that's stagnant and it stagnates us. 
and it keeps us in a web from moving forward for the things that matter, that we can buy the assets and do those things that build us well. How do you slay in your finances? Okay, so that's what I want to leave with you today. So that you're always, always, always conscious of your gifts and your talents. That's huge. Operate in them. That's where your wealth lies. The idea that Pearl puts herself out to do this and to pour into our future generations, that's her seed. That's her gift. Whenever you see Pearl in that, it's like she's just having fun. Not that she's not trying to figure out how in the world all of this is going to come together. But she understands her gifts and talents and her purpose. And then I want you to tune in more to the land. When you think about buildings like this, and a lot of times when I do presentations, I'm in hotels and places, and I always think about Conrad Hilton. I think about Conrad Hilton who bought his first hotel in Dallas, Texas. And generation after generation continues to flourish from that one asset. And that would have been okay if he had just bought one, but no, he went on to buy hundreds, if not thousands of properties all over. And so we see Paris Hilton now She's a generational blessing of one decision that someone made. So that's the ability, it's no different. That same decision that every last one of us can make to do something to start building wealth has a generational impact that impacts for generations and generations to come. And that impact may only be to change the mindset of someone in your family. That could be the seed that you plant. It may be to buy a house that you leave for future generations to now have an asset and value home ownership. That could be the thing that you do and you leave. It could be buying a rental property, a building, a patch of land that seemingly has no value that you buy and you just pay taxes on and you leave that behind, and lo and behold, 20 years later, your great-grandkids are developing it. But all of those decisions come with you being able to inform them of the importance of what they're doing and what you're doing. We're not buying the new Jordans because we're investing in this. We're not taking that trip this time because we're doing this. It's not to just do all this and leave to a generation and wonder why they don't value it. I have one son who knows, I'll take your name off everything <laughs> if you don't do the right thing, if you're not committed to what this is. And so think about that generationally. All right, I'm out of here. How do you slay? All right. Look, y'all, I wasn't ready. Hold on now. Woo! Yes, yes. Sonia! Hey, hey, hey! You all give it up for the amazing. Wow, Sonia. Sonia, thank you so much for all of those pearls of wisdom. I'm getting myself together. I'm so thankful she is a mentor for me.